Hello, my name is Charlie Miller, and I'm here alongside Mary Miller, and we are today interviewing Keith Wicker. Um, today's date is August 7th, 2022, and we are interviewing uh, via Zoom for the Library of Congress. Um, the first question I want to ask you is some of your biographical information, like your date okay. and place of birth. Okay. My name is actually Brian Wicker. I go by Keith. It's my middle name. Um, the place of birth is uh, Baltimore, Maryland. September 5th, 1963. All right. And uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your parents and their occupations and if they served in the military? Uh, my parents, my father was in the Navy. He was an officer in the Navy uh, during World War II on ships um, in Pan Pacific Theater and um, all over the place, actually. Um, then he was back in Maryland. Um, my mom, uh, she was a housewife, uh, uh, social butterfly and housewife. <laughs> so that's pretty much it. So. All right. And, uh, what schooling did you attend before joining the military? Uh, before the military, I was in high school in Baltimore. And then after that, I attended, uh, college for two years while I was working. I was, um, I was working then, and then I joined the military in 1983. And did you didn't hold any jobs prior to entering? Was that your first job? Oh, I did. Yeah, no, I worked for I worked for the Southland Corporation. I was a field representative for the Southland Corporation, who owns 7-Eleven. Um, I did that uh, for two years, um, and I also I also worked for them while I was. I joined through the National Guard is how I, I joined the military. So in Maryland. Um, do you remember exactly where you enlisted and what date you enlisted? Not the exact date. Um, I enlisted in Bel Air, Maryland, actually, uh, at the National Guard unit there, which was a 224th attack helicopter battalion. And what were your family's thoughts on you enlisting? My family was fine. My father, of course, um, wanted me to go to the Navy, but I didn't. So <laughs> I decided I wanted to go to the military because I wanted to fly helicopters. So very cool. Um, and what were your like initial motivations to join? Was it more following your father's footsteps, or did something in the military call to you? Uh, more patriotic, and also I am a big fan of aviation. I I, I got my pilot's license when I was fourteen and a half. Um, and then I wanted to, I wanted to continue with that and a good career path was the military and I wanted to teach. So that's, that's where that went. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, and what was, uh, your first initial training? Like what happened exactly after you enlisted? Did you go straight to boot camp or? Uh, first initial training was, yeah, straight to boot camp at Fort McClellan, Alabama. Um, was there and then after that I went to Fort Rucker Alabama for initially I was a helicopter mechanic I went to become a 67 November which is a, a UH-1H helicopter mechanic that was the MOS back then um, finished that up uh, we, you want to know more about boot camp how it was or anything like that or yeah yes yeah, sure, it was sure. as it was it was pretty much as I expected it um, it was a, it was a good training experience. It was uh, in a very hot environment, uh, a lot of physical activity, a lot of um, it, just, it's kind of hard to remember as far back as that. I'm an old guy, so it's um, you know, I guess the most I remember is or, or the fondest memories are some of the instructors were very good. Some of the drill sergeants were very good. Uh, some of the teachers were good. Um, that's, I don't, I can't think of anything that stands out a whole lot about boot camp other than it was go, 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 go the whole time. So. Do you remember anything about like initial culture shocks, um, like transferring to such a different environment? Yeah, there was it, there was a culture shock there. Um, in of course, we were pretty secluded out in Fort Mc, at Fort McClellan because 
it's out in the middle of nowhere. I don't even know if it's around anymore. Um, but um, culture shock with within being with a lot of different people, different from different backgrounds. Uh, that was that was pretty shocky. Uh, uh, just, I guess, just just that different people of um, different backgrounds, different. Um, Different lifestyles, different different colors. Um, that's that's it. So, hmm. and what was kind of an average day um, at boot camp? Like, what time would you wake up? And what average you- day? I guess we would wake up at about six. Um, get up, go out to PT. Um, it was dark when we would go out at first. Uh, go out to the PT field and begin um, with calisthenics, and then we would run after that. Um, and that, that pretty much was every day. Uh, and then we'd go to um, regular basic training classes, um, rifle range, um, navigation, uh, trying to remember all the other things they taught during that time um hygiene you know it's a very very basic stuff a lot of very very basic stuff and you know and like the rifle range and uh, the grenade range um a lot of outdoor stuff a lot of bivouac stuff where you were outdoors and camping um so and did you come in with a lot um maybe more knowledge for lack of a better word since you had your um pilot's license at 14 and a half um it sounds like you were kind of well on your way to knowing um which part of the military you i guess the air force that you wanted to be in uh the army yeah but no, um, army, sorry. yeah yeah um, we're talking about basic training but um pilot training is when i went to fort rucker um and that's um and that's when it became fun so basic training is no fun so. <laughs> But um, at Fort Rucker is when uh, Fort Rucker, Alabama, which is down in the panhandle of Alabama, uh, is when we got to start flying and got to go to ground school. And yes, my training prior did help a lot. But I had a stint between, um, between basic training. I went to, I went to um, training to be a mechanic. Um, then I went back to Maryland and applied for flight school into the warrant officer program. And that's when I didn't, I didn't even get to turn a wrench. Basically I got back to, I got back to Maryland, applied for flight school and then got accepted very quickly. And that's when I basically, I wasted my time going to mechanic school, which I loved though. I, I, I loved going to the mechanic school, but um, I guess they wanted that progression, which really helped. It really helped in the um, knowing the mechanics of the aircraft before you actually got to fly them. So. Mm-hmm. And where was your, uh, where was your flight school again? At Fort Rucker, Alabama. Oh God. Um, it's in it's in Dothan, Alabama, uh, Daleville. Actually, it's a Daleville, Dothan area in Alabama. So. And what was uh, I guess what were you learning in the flight school that you hadn't learned with your pilot's license already? Well, helicopters are totally different. I, I learned fixed wing originally. I flew fixed wing originally. Uh, it's when I got my pilot's license um, in, and then I did a bunch of cross countries and things like that. Um, and then during flight school, you learn helicopters. Um, I started out in the uh, the Hughes, very small Hughes three sixty nine aircraft. It uh, looks like a little bumblebee. The military stopped using those about two years after we learned in them. Uh, they went to a different helicopter. Um, and then from that point, I went to the UH-1, which is a Huey, which was the Vietnam era aircraft. Um, and that's where I learned um, most of my flight in, in flight school. 
was the UH one. After that, um, I came back to Maryland and I mean, we, uh, I don't know what you, how in depth you want all this, but I can go, I can talk forever. I, I, I know you have other things to talk about or, or move on to. Um, you know, basic aircraft flight was taught at Fort Rucker uh, in the UH-1. We went through um, Warren Officer Candidate School, which was, um, it's a pretty tough school. Uh, every day is like, again, it's like basic training but you're going to flight school at this point. You're getting up early, early. You're going to uh, schools to begin with. Uh, you're learning basic officer stuff at that point. Um, then you're taught ground school. Uh, a lot of uh, physical training during that time also. Um, you're dealing with um, TAC officers, uh, tactical training officers um, that are other warrant officers that are training you. Um, and then you go to your, your flight school, which um, during that time, flight school was taught by civilians. Uh, they had civilian contractors that taught um, a lot of the ground school there um, that had been there forever that were prior um, military, but they went into becoming um, civilian instructors down in Fort Rucker. Um, after that training, completed through warrant officer course and everything, and um, then I came back to Maryland again. Uh, flew for a while there. Then I was sent back down to Fort Rucker for attack helicopter training. At that point, I learned how to fly the UH or the AH-1 Cobra, the AH-1S and the AH-1F, um, the Cobras, because we had went from a UH-1 unit to a attack helicopter unit, the 224th attack helicopter. Um, flew. I had a very quick progression going through all this, so um, I'm trying to remember exactly how it happened. Then after that, I went through, um, I basically, I went through, uh, I had a two, during, there was a two week portion where I try to remember what that was between. It was between um, flight school and um, a tech helicopter. Um, I went to air assault school, which was at Fort Rucker again. And that's basically repelling and things like that. Another very physical training um, up quite early. It's worse than basic training for two weeks. But <laughs> so then after that, okay, that's all done. Um, and I went to attack helicopter school, came back after that and was in a, was flying in attack helicopters, became a pilot in command in attack helicopters. And just shortly after that, I went down to Fort Rucker once more. I spent most of my time at Fort Rucker. So I went down to Fort Rucker once more and I went to the um, instrument or the attack helicopter instructor pilots course. And that was another 16 weeks um, going through training how to teach people how to fly the AH-1, um, that, was a, that was a fun course actually, because by that time you were very comfortable in the aircraft, I was very comfortable in the aircraft, and then I was learning how to teach people, uh, becoming an instructor pilot. Came back to Maryland again, taught for quite a while, um, probably about a year actually, and then I was sent back down to Fort Rucker to become an instrument flight examiner. Probably the toughest course in the military as far as um, aircraft training. Um, it's a it's a fourteen week course. Um, the first when I was going through, I was the I was the youngest instrument flight examiner um, to to come out of it. 
Um, I was 23 years old at that point. And then um, came back to Maryland again. That course, the instrument flight examiner course, again, is very tough. Um, that's taught in UH1s. It's um, basically your, and it's taught in UH1s and in the, um, the simulators. Uh, you spend a lot of time in simulators and um, then you're in the aircraft. Um, but most of the time that you spend during that time is you never see the ground. You're always virtually in the clouds. So either you're flying an aircraft, a real aircraft with blinds over the windshields and just by instruments, or you're in a, um, a simulator. Um, and then after that, I went back, um, served a long time uh, with the National Guard, uh, taught in the National Guard. I was a double dipper. It was what they called us at that point. I was in the National Guard. I was also a GS-13 in the government, um, where I had a, um, a, a government position teaching the same, having the same job, but full time as a a full-time flight instructor for the National Guard, uh, an instrument flight examiner. Did that for a very long time. Um, what else did I do there? Um, oh, I went back down to Fort Rucker, and then I became because you had to you had to be type rated in each aircraft that you flew. So I went back down and I became a UH one. Um, instructor pilot also. So I was an instructor pilot and then I became, I, then I went back down for UH-60. Um, so I became, a, 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 I was an instructor pilot in pretty much every helicopter the, the army had an instrument and also an instrument flight examiner. So um, did all that. And then that was all in Maryland. And by that time, in 2000, or actually 1997, um, I'd finished up there and moved to Durango, Colorado. Um, then I was in the unit in Santa Fe, New Mexico, flying, um, flying helicopters there, flying UH-1s there again. Um, gotten out of the attack helicopter. I was in a, um, a medevac unit at that point. Uh, during that time, uh, again, taught in the mountains, did mountain training, um, came back, and then I, um, I was having trouble driving back and forth to the mat because I, I, I had given up my, I'd given up my um, government career at that point. I, I, I got a partial retirement. Um, and then I was just in a National Guard at that point. And I was driving back and forth from Durango to Santa Fe to maintain my, um, my flight hours. You have to maintain a certain amount of flight hours per month. Um, it's part of what's called your ATP. But um, I found a, a unit in Durango, Colorado. It was a ground unit. Then I became the commander of the ground unit in a um, ground maintenance unit in Durango, the 350th in Durango, Colorado. And then in 2001, just before 9-11 uh, actually, um, is when I left the military. Um, I'll tell you the reason for it. Um, my, my partner at the time, you know, all this time, we're talking, I'm gay and in the military. So during all that time, we're talking about during Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We're talking about during the Bush administrations and all that. I could go into, that's a whole nother story I'd go into. But I um, had a partner at the time in Durango, Colorado. We owned a chiropractic company there. Um, so then I was the commander of the ground unit. And just before um, just before 9-11, I decided, um, this is before anything even happened, I decided to leave because my partner had become HIV positive. 
um, and he was having a lot of trouble with it. And um, that was pretty much the end of my military career at that point. So total of um, 18 years in the military. Um, and I have my retirement. I have retirement from, from both places. It begins because I finished in the National Guard. Um, I was never deployed, by the way. I never, um, I was, because of my position, I was not expendable um, as, as an instrument flight examiner, as one of 18 instrument flight examiners in, in the U.S. Um, so I could not be deployed. But I taught a lot of people how to fly and how to stay safe and, and how to take care of themselves, which I feel like I really, um, I did my duty to the U.S. And then, so. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit? It sounds like maybe you left, obviously, earlier than what you um, would have planned. Is, is that fair That's to true, say? yes. Yes, that's okay. fair. Yes, it's, it's a very true statement. Yeah. Um, I left... I, I left my position in Maryland um, because my partner wanted to move out to Durango. I didn't want to leave my position in Maryland. Um, it was sort of a, a relationship-based move. <laughs> so we all we all give up things. And hindsight, I wish I would have stayed. I left a lot of friends and people back in Maryland that I flew with and I loved what I did. Um, I didn't like the bureaucracy a lot. Um, I didn't like the, I didn't like hiding myself. You know, people don't understand how easy they have it now, uh, being in the military and being able to be gay, even though, you know, I, I'm sure it's still tough to be out. Um, but um, yeah, I, I lament actually having left at that point. Um, and then um, I was kind of, I guess, fly, and I, but I did go back to flying. Um, I went back to flying privately in Durango, which was kind of cool. Um, so uh, at least I got to fly again. But I was uh, being a ground commander as a warrant, as a chief warrant officer. You know, it was funny because they were like, oh, you'll never have to have a command as a warrant officer. Okay, that's cool. You just get to teach and fly and everything. Bam, I was a... <laughs> <laughs> that I became the commander of the ground unit there. So, um, I'd love to maybe just ask when you say um, lament leaving, is it fair to say lament leaving partly because it did get easier for people who were in the military? Or is I was, it also you know, the, I lament it because I loved my career. Um, I was pretty much out. Back then, um, and I was before, you know, because I was in the transition of don't ask, don't tell. People knew about me and being in being in aviation, aviation, there are a lot of very smart people, a lot of very progressive people. Um, it's a different. It's a different group. Um, and I had a couple of friends that were also in the military um, that were that are gay, they're uh, another retiree that I know, and she's, um, she's been with her partner, partner ever since. Um, we, I knew her back then. Um, and we still maintain friendship and everything, but uh, she's back in Maryland. Uh, she's also a, um, she's a dirt track racer, and she's my age on, <laughs> on motocross, <laughs> but Scott. I'm always like Lisa, you're gonna hurt yourself one day, but she's like, yeah. but anyway, I, I'm I'm digressing. But um, I think that I could have kept it hidden, but I didn't want to keep it hidden. Um, it was it was certain groups who you know that knew certain groups that thought, and certain groups that it went over their head. Uh, that's you know it's really not anybody's business, so. Mm -hmm. and maybe then I'll just transition one more um, question on this topic is, so you left obviously right before a significant event in this nation's right. history. Um, can you maybe even just talk about probably to be on the outside looking in after 20 plus years in the military, maybe how that felt as well? It was tough. Um, was, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was at the chiropractic office and um, 
in Durango and Ignacio actually outside of Durango. And um, I had a call in from a patient that asked, um, hey, Keith, you were in the military. What's going on? Like, what? Because I hadn't heard anything. I, like, turned the TV on, and that's when it was. And I was like, oh, God. I, um, you know, it was like, and I had just, I had just left. I had, I had just left the military. Um, like, two months prior, actually. Um, and um, I thought, you know, I'd love to go. I would love to go back to Fort Rucker and teach again, maybe. Or, but my life had changed so much at that point because of my, um, my partner at the time uh, becoming HIV positive and everything else that went on with that. Um, so, um, yeah, I, um, I just hope that I taught the people that went there enough. And I, I do have stories that came back to me about, you know, I was there and what I thought about was what Mr. Wicker had taught me. So, which is kind of cool. So. Mm, yeah, that's very cool. Um, just transition a little bit back to, I guess, that don't ask, don't tell side of your history. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit more that about that. Um, I guess you obviously said in the beginning, you're very patriotic, but I'm kind of wondering like what motivated you to keep serving something that I guess as a majority was almost anti of your lifestyle and um, your sexuality, I guess, how did you continue to, to fight for the military when they were, you know, so homophobic? Because I was very good at what I did and I knew it. Other people around me knew it. Um, my, I have a funny, I have a quick, funny story. I was, when I was at Fort Rucker, Alabama and teaching, I had a, my, my base commander, uh, General Bunting, um, Anyway, I had, a, I had a student that tried to bring me up on sexual harassment charges, a female student. And I had failed her on a flight of Al and all this, and she brought me up on sexual harassment charges. Um, saying that I had made passes towards her and things like that. Because, you know, she was not doing so well in her school. So... My general brought her in and said, you know, I know Mr. Wicker. I know he wouldn't do it. And that's all there is to it. And you're out of here. He knew about me. So that was kind of a cool story. Um, the, as far as uh, being patriotic, I don't think, you know, because of <sighs> being gay and being patriotic are totally two different things. You know that. And um, I would still fight for my country, uh, even knowing that they didn't want me in the military. Um, I would have I would have fought um, to maintain to be in the military. I didn't have to do that though, um, because of my position. I think people just left me alone, um, and. Because of my position, I was able to um, I was able to maintain it being basically being indispensable. You know, um, I, don't, I don't know I don't know where to go with that because it's it's like you're saying, knowing people that didn't want you in there. Well, there were people that knew about me that really revered me, um, and. I know of a couple of people that reviled me too, but um, I, you know, I was called a faggot by one of <laughs> I was called a faggot by one of my um, fellow warrant officers in the military, and it still sticks to me this day. But I got to fail him on a check ride. For <laughs> it wasn't because of that, though, because he couldn't pass, but. You know, it was just, it's, we should, we should probably take that out of here, but <laughs> it's, um, 
that was no problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, that wasn't the reason I failed him though. That wasn't I, I still, you know, it's it was a professional thing, but you know, it was it was kind of a little zinger that I was able to, you know, and not pass him because he couldn't pass. But he also called me a faggot at one point. So um, yeah, that's things you had to put up with. Um, and the only reason he knew that was because word got out at one point. But still, my my commanding officer in um, Maryland knew about me. Um, a bunch of my fellow aviators knew about me. Um, and it was never an issue, really, being in aviation, except for the the errant few that, um, so, you know, in my position in the, the U.S. government, I was, I was a GS-13, step 12, so a very high level of um, GS or general services, um, so, or government services, rather, but um, my rank, my, my, um, my government rank outranked my military rank, and it also outranked a bunch of. Um, it outranked my um, commander also. <laughs> so yeah, but anyway. All right, um, and I was quite feared yeah. too because, as an instrument flight examiner, you're at the top. Uh, you're you're as an instrument flight examiner. You are you are the top examiner or the top level of flight instructor and examiner. So, I actually have one question uh, about helicopters now. Okay, um, what was kind of like the power dynamic between you and your fellow soldiers in the helicopter versus on the ground? Is it a lot different, or did you see similarities? Uh, the power dynamic, um, because Sorry, I mean, in terms of like teamwork, I guess. And, te and teamwork is always teamwork um, in a helicopter. You always had, um, especially in the attack helicopters, because in the attack helicopters, you're seen in tandem, you're front and back. Um, the gunner is in the front, the pilot is in the back, or the pilot gunner, and the co pilot is in the front. As an instructor, I taught from the front. Of the helicopter and the um, and the Cobra and the Apache, they're taught like that, um, and you have to know what the guy in the back is doing at all times. Basically, it's instinctual because you you feel him on the controls because he's on the same controls as you are, but a separate set, of course. And you're always ready to take over and things like that. But um, by the time you're teaching these people in helicopters, in in attack helicopter stuff, they've gone through a lot of training. Um, as far as the as far as the power dynamic, being an instructor pilot and being being a um, instrument flight examiner, even on the ground, people like they revere you because you've been through a lot you've been through a lot of training um they come to ask you all kinds of questions all um anything that deals with the faa or with um flight dynamics i mean i taught ground school um it's just it's um so you the dynamic was pretty much the same on the ground and in the air. I mean, we had fun. Um, we'd go out and cut up and everything. Back when I drank, I don't drink anymore. But <laughs> the, um, it's, uh, I don't know, what, what, what else do you want to know about that question? How, what? No, yeah, that was great. Yeah, okay. it made a lot of sense. Um, Mom, do you have any other questions about uh, Keith or are you ready to transition? Um, yeah, no. Why don't you transition them? All right. Um, so do you remember uh, like the day your service ended? Um, I mean, you talked a little bit about where you were, but you remember the exact date and your final rank? My final rank was uh, CW2. Um, I 
finished up in March of 2001 um, at Durango, Colorado. Um, I did all my paperwork with um, my staff sergeant at the time, finished all that up with um, Staff Sergeant uh, Travis Parker was a um, super, super good guy. Um, you know, as a commander, that's the person you lean on is your staff sergeant. Um, and he basically, he basically did all my work for me. So, <laughs> you know, as a commander, you just, you're just sort of a figurehead and you, you make decisions and everything and you teach also. But um, that's, that's the day I left. Um, it was, I can't remember the exact day in March, but um, I could go look it up. No wrong. We'll get on the form. Okay. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about kind of what you're doing now? And uh, if you have any ties to the military still, or just kind of, you know, what you're doing in your everyday life. Uh, right now I own a, a custom framing shop in San Francisco. Uh, I moved to San Francisco uh, in 2005. Um, and I was flying helicopters here. When I got when I got here, I flew for KTVU, and um, I flew for um, seven years for KTVU, for KPIX, and for ABC. Wow! Uh, yeah, that was fun. And um, then my partner, at, uh, I was married. I be, I got married um, and divorced. <laughs> um, we're still great friends, Tony. Bardo is my um, uh, is my ex-husband. And then um, Lloyd, he and I got together in 20, oh gosh, uh, I can't even remember. This is awful. But um, we've been we've been together like nine, 10 years. We've been 10 years. So, um, and then uh, we started the frame shop. He had a frame shop before me and we moved it and we went in as partners in 2013 and we've had it since then where um where we moved it um on gary boulevard i love doing what i'm doing um as far as ties to the military it's kind of cool because i get people like um retirees and veterans that come in with medals and things like that and um with mementos uh memorabilia uh doing shadow boxes for them and things um I and then I get to talk to them and I get to hear their stories, which is kind of cool. Pleasure. And then um, the it's like this, you know, doing this flag for you for 9-11. That means a lot to me. Um, it means a lot to um, to do that because of what the memory is and what you know what happened and uh, what a day it was for at a time for, for America. There's that. <laughs>